Well, I warned you, you're not sleeping tonight. There are many excellent stories to keep us entertained while the COVID virus picks us off one by one. Just as things, <laughs> things happen in this story. In Amundsen's Tent is a short horror fiction by John Martin Leahy, set in 1911 around the expedition of Norwegian Roald Amundsen and Englishman Robert Falcon Scott competing to reach the South Pole and reaching it within a few days of each other. I present it here somewhat condensed and polished for an audio presentation. It was published in Weird Tales in 1928. Travelers are sometimes said to tell marvelous stories, as did Robert Drumgold, the sole survivor of the party which had reached the Southern Pole. But it is a noteworthy fact that in nine cases out of ten, the marvelous stories of travelers have been confirmed. This record I am at last giving to the world, but the truth is that I thought it the work of Drumgold's deranged mind. Little wonder that his mind had given way, what with the horror of that fate which was closing in upon him. What was it, that thing that came to him, thrust itself into his tent, and left but Drumgold's severed head there? Any explanation we conceived at the time, in that desolate, ice-mantled spot where he met his end, was far from the truth. Eastman, Dahlstrom, and I all feared that the publication of so extraordinary a record might cast a cloud of doubt upon the real achievements of the expedition. But of late, our ideas and beliefs have undergone a change that is nothing less than a metamorphosis. How vividly it all rises before me again. The white expanse, glaring, blinding in the untempered light of the Antarctic sun. The dogs, straining in the harness. The cases on the sleds, long and black like coffins. Our sudden halt as Eastman fetched up in his tracks, pointed and said, What's that? A half mile or so off to the left, some object broke the blinding white of the plains. Nunatak, I suppose, was my answer. Odd nunataks, hummocks of rock, were occasionally seen poking out of the ice in those climbs. Looks to me like a cairn or a tent, Dahlstrom said. How on earth, I queried, could a tent have got down here? We are far from the root of either Amundsen or Scott. Huh, said Eastman, shoving his amber-colored glasses up onto his forehead that he might get a better look. I wonder. I believe that you're right. The next moment we were in motion, heading straight for the mysterious object, there in the midst of the eternal desolation of snow and ice. Look there. Eastman, who was leading the way with his sled and dogs, suddenly shouted, See that? It is a tent. But who had pitched it there? What were we to find within it? I could never describe our thoughts and feelings as we approached that spot. The snow lay piled about the tent to a depth of four feet or more. Nearby, a splintered ski protruded from the surface. And that was all. And the stillness. The air was without the slightest movement. No sounds but those made by our movements and those of the dogs broke that awful silence of death. Poor devils, Eastman said at last. One thing, they certainly pitched their tent well. The tent was supported by a single pole set in the middle. To this pole, three guy lines were fastened, one of them as taut as the day its stake had been driven into the surface. But this was not all. A half dozen lines or more were attached to the sides of the tent. 
There it had stood for we knew not how long, bidding defiance to the fierce winds of that terrible region. Dulcim and I each got a spade and began to remove the snow. The entrance we found unfastened, but completely blocked from outside by a couple of empty provision cases and a piece of canvas. How on earth, I exclaimed, did those things get into that position? The wind, said Dahlstrom, and if the entrance had not been blocked, there wouldn't have been any tent here now. The wind would have split and destroyed it long ago. The next moment we had cleared the entrance. I thrust my head through the opening. Strangely enough, very little snow had drifted in. The tent was dark green, a circumstance which rendered the light within somewhat weird and ghastly. What do you see, Bill? asked Eastman. What's inside? My answer was a cry, and the next instant I had sprung back from the entrance. What is it, Bill? Eastman exclaimed. Great heaven, what is it, man? A head, I told him, a human head. No body, not even stripped bones, only that severed head. Could the party's dogs have done this? And where are Sutherland and Travers? Dogs, Dahlstrom said. This is not the work of dogs. We stood looking down upon the grisly remnant of mortality. It wasn't dogs, said Dahlstrom. Eastman queried, what other explanation is there except cannibalism? A shudder went through my heart. Our discovery of a good supply of food on the sled, at that moment completely hidden by the snow, was to show us that that fearful explanation was not the true one. Yes, surely the explorer had been set upon by his dogs and devoured, but why had the animals left that head? in the frozen blue eyes and upon the frozen features of which was a look of horror that sends a shudder through my very soul, even now. It did not have the mark of a single fang, though the head appeared to have been chewed from the trunk. And there, in the man's story, in the story of poor dead Robert Drumgold, we found another mystery as insoluble, if it was true, as the presence here of his severed head. There the story was, scrawled in lead pencil across the pages of his journal. It lies before me, and I now proceed to set down the story of Robert Drumgold in his own words. Not a word, not a comma shall be deleted, inserted, or changed. Let it begin with his entry for January the 3rd, at the end of which day the little party was only 15 miles from the pole. Here it is. January 3rd, latitude of our camp, 89 degrees, 45 minutes, 10 seconds, only 15 miles more, and the pole is ours. Unless Avinson or Scott has beaten us to it, but it will be ours just the same, even if the glory of discovery is found to be another's. What shall we find there? All are in fine spirits. Even the dogs seem to know that this is the consummation of some great achievement, and a thing that is a mystery to us is the interest they have shown today in the region before us. Every time we halted, there they were, gazing and gazing straight south, and sometimes sniffing and sniffing. What does it mean? Everything is auspicious. The weather for the last three days has been simply glorious. Not once in this time has it been colder than five below. The blue of the sky is like that of which painters dream, and in that blue, tower cloud formations, violet-tinged in the shadows, beautiful beyond all description. If it were possible to forget the fact that nothing stands between ourselves and a horrible death except the meager supply of food on the sleds, one could think he was in some glorious fairyland of white and blue and violet. A fairyland? Why has that thought so often occurred to me? Why have I so often likened this desolate region to fairyland? To human beings it is frightful beyond all words. But, though so unutterably terrible to men, 
it may not be so in reality. After all, are all things on this earth of ours, to say nothing of the universe made for man, this godlike spirit in the body of a quasi-ape? May there not be other beings, yes, even on this very earth, more wonderful than he, and more terrible too? Heaven knows more than once in this desolation of snow and ice, I have seemed to feel their presence in the air about us, nameless entities, disembodied, watching. Nor is rational physical existence conditioned on warm blood. There may be intelligences not requiring daily food and warmth. They might be lost in the abysses of the ocean or laid up on a stormy cliff through the tempests of an arctic winter, or plunged in a volcano for a hundred years, and yet possess consciousness and thought. And these entities, nameless things whose presence I seem to feel at times, are they benign beings, or are they things more fearful than even the madness of the human brain can fashion? But then I must stop this. If Sutherland or Travers were to read what I've set down here, they would think that I was losing my senses, or would declare me already insane. And yet, as there is a heaven above us, it seems that I do actually believe that this frightful place knows the presence of beings other than ourselves and our dogs, things which we cannot see, but which are watching us. Enough of this. Only fifteen miles from the pole, now for a sleep, and on to a goal in the morning. Morning. There's no morning here, but day unending. The sun now rides as high at midnight as it does at midday. Of course, there is a change in altitude, but it is so slight as to be imperceptible without an instrument. But the pole. Tomorrow the pole. What will we find there? January 4. The mystery and horror of this day. How could I ever set that down? So fearful were those hours through which we passed, I find myself wondering if it wasn't all only a dream. A dream. Would to heaven that it had been but a dream. As for the end, I must keep such thoughts out of my head got under way at an early hour, weather more wondrous than ever, sky and azure that would have sent a painter into ecstasies, cloud formations indescribably beautiful and grand. The place was a great plain, stretching away with a monotonous uniformity of surface as far as the eye could reach, a plain never trodden by human foot before. At length, when we were drawing near to the pole, the keen eyes of Travers detected some object rising above the blinding white of the snow. On the instant, Sutherland had thrust his amber glasses up onto his forehead and had his binoculars to his eyes. Cairn, he exclaimed, and his voice sounded hollow and very strange. A cairn or a tent? Boys, they've beaten us to the pole. He handed the glasses to Travers and leaned against the provision cases on his sled in dismay, as though a sudden weariness had settled upon him. I felt very sorry for our brave leader in those moments of terrible disappointment, but for the life of me, I did not know what to say. At that moment, a cloud concealed the sun, and the place where we stood was suddenly involved in a gloom that was deep and awful. So sudden and pronounced was the change that we gazed about us with curious and wondering looks. Far off to the right and to the left, the plain blazed white and blinding. Soon, however, the last gleam of sunshine had vanished from off of it. I raised my look up to the heavens. Here and there, edges of cloud were touched as though with golden fire. But even then, that light was fading. A few minutes and the last gleam of the sun had vanished. A curious haze concealed the blue expanse of the sky overhead. There was not the slightest movement in the gloomy and weird atmosphere. The silence was 
heavy, awful, the silence of the abode of utter desolation and of death. What on earth are we in for now? said Travers. Sutherland moved from his sled and stood gazing about into the eerie gloom. Queer change, this, said he. It means a blizzard, most likely. I observed, hadn't we better make camp before it strikes us? No telling what a blizzard may be like in this awful spot. Blizzard, said Sutherland. I don't think it means a blizzard, Bob. No telling, though. Mighty queer change, certainly. Travers, he asked, can you make it out? He waved a hand in the direction of that mysterious object, the sight of which had so suddenly brought us to a halt. I say in the direction of the object, for the thing itself was no longer to be seen. I believe it is a tent, Travers told him. Well, said our leader, we can soon find out what it is, care or tent for one or the other it must certainly be. The next instant that heavy, awful silence was broken by the sharp crack of his whip. Mush on, you poor brutes, he cried. On we go to see what is over there. Here we are at the South Pole. Let us see who has beaten us to it. But the dogs refused to go on which did not surprise me at all, because for some time now they had been showing signs of some strange, inexplicable uneasiness. What had got into them anyway? They were afraid, afraid. An inadequate word, indeed. It was stark, terrible fear that had entered the poor beasts. The thing they feared, whatever it was, was in that very direction in which we were headed. What on earth is the matter with them? exclaimed Travers. Again we got in motion. The place was still involved in that strange, weird gloom. The silence was still profound. Slowly but steadily we moved forward, urging on the reluctant, fearful animals with our whips. At last Sutherland, who was leading, cried out that he saw it. He halted, peering forward into the gloom. It must be a tent, he said. It was a small tent, supported by a single bamboo pole, and well guyed in all directions, made of drab-colored gabardine. From the top of the tent pole, motionless in the still air, hung the remains of a small Norwegian flag, and underneath it a pennant with the word Fram upon it, Amundsen's tent. What should we find inside it? And what was the meaning of that, the strange way it bulged out on one side? The entrance was securely laced. The tent, it was certain, had been here for a year, all through the long Antarctic night, and the snow was drifted up about it. For some minutes we just stood there, and many dreadful thoughts came and went. All through the long Antarctic night, what strange things this tent could tell us if it had the power of words. What was that inside making the tent bulge out in so unaccountable a manner? I moved forward to feel of it there with my mittened hand, but for some reason that I cannot explain, of a sudden I drew back. At that instant one of the dogs whined, the sound so strange, and the terror of the animal so unmistakable that I shuddered. The other dogs began to whine in that mysterious manner, and all shrank back cowering from the tent. What does it mean? whispered Travers. Look at them. It is as though they are begging us to keep away. Their senses are keener than ours, said Travers. They already know what it may be. Sutherland wondered. Poor fellows, they reached the pole, but did they ever leave it? Are we going to find them in there dead? The dogs would never act that way if it was only a corpse inside. Besides, wouldn't the sleds be here to tell the story? Look around, the place is flat and level. No sled lies buried here. 
What can it mean? said our leader. What could make the tent bulge out like that? Well, we'd best unleash the entrance and look inside. He began to unlace it. At that instant, an icy current of air struck the place. The pennant above our heads flapped with a dull and ominous sound. One of the dogs, too, let forth with a deep and long-drawn howl. And while that mournful, savage sound yet filled the air, a strange thing happened. Through a sudden rent in that gloomy curtain of cloud, the sun sent a shaft of light down upon the spot where we stood. The plain on each side was still darkened by that weird gloom, now denser and more eerie than ever. Travers said, just like a beam lying across a stage in a theater. For some moments, so strange was it all, we stood there looking about us in wonder, and perhaps each one of us in secret awe. Up above, the pennant flapped and flapped again, the sound of it hollow and ghostly. Again rose the long-drawn, fiercely sad howl of the wolf dog. But we don't want to be imagining things, you know, added our leader. A little space and the entrance was open, and Sutherland had thrust head and shoulders through it. I don't know how long it was that he stood there like that. Perhaps it was only a few seconds, but to Travers and me it seemed endless. What is it? Travers exclaimed at last. What do you see? The answer was a scream. The horror of that sound I can never forget. Sutherland came staggering back and, I believe, would have fallen had we not sprung and caught him. In God's name, Sutherland, what did you see? cried Travers. Sutherland's look was wild and horrible. What is it? I exclaimed. What did you see in there? I can't tell you. I can't. Don't look, boys. Don't look into that tent unless you are prepared to welcome madness or worse. What gibberish is this? Travers demanded. Come on, man. Buck up. Get a grip on yourself. Let's have an end. Why should the sight of a dead man affect you like this? Sutherland laughed. The sound wild, maniacal. A dead man, queried our leader, peering into the face of Travers. You think I saw a dead man? I wish it was only a dead man. On the instant Travers had turned. Well, said he, I'm going to look. But Sutherland cried out, screamed, sprang after him and tried to drag him back. Horror! Perhaps madness, cried Sutherland. Look at me, do you want to be like me? No, Travers returned, but I am going to see what is in that tent. He struggled to break free, but Sutherland clung to him in a frenzy of madness. Help me, Bob, Sutherland cried. Hold him back or we'll all go insane. I did not help him to hold Travers back, for of course it had become my belief that Sutherland was insane. Nor was Sutherland successful in holding Travers. With a sudden wrench, Travers was free. The next instant he had thrust head and shoulders through the entrance of the tent. I moved toward the entrance, but Sutherland flung himself at me with such violence that I was sent over into the snow. I sprang to my feet full of anger and amazement. What the hell is the matter with you anyway? Have you gone crazy? I cried. The answer was a groan, horrible beyond all words. But that sound did not come from Sutherland. I turned. Travers was staggering away from the entrance, a hand pressed over his face, sounds that I could never describe breaking from deep in his throat. Sutherland, as the man came staggering up to him, thrust forth an arm and touched Travers lightly on the shoulder. Travers sprang aside as though a serpent had struck at him, screamed and screamed yet again. It can't belong to this earth. That horror was never born on this planet of ours, moaned Travers. Well, consoled Sutherland, it is dead. It must be dead. Dead? How do we know that it's dead? And don't forget this. It didn't come here alone. At that moment, the sunlight vanished. 
What do you mean, Sutherland asked. Not alone? How do you know? It's there inside the tent, but the entrance was laced from the outside. And I knew the nameless fear and horror that chilled him to the very heart. Again there rose that mournful howl of the wolf dog, and again the silence of desolation and of death lay upon the spot. But above the tent, the pennant stirred and rustled. The sound of it, I thought, like the slithering of some repulsive serpent. What did you see in there? I asked them. Bob, Bob, said Sutherland, don't ask us that. It can't be any worse than this mystery, I said, turning. The two of them threw themselves before me and barred my way. No, said Sutherland firmly. You must not see that, that, believe us, Bob, it's for your sake. Very well, I acquiesced. I can't help saying, though, that the whole thing seems to me like the dream of a madman. Believe that. Believe that we're insane. Believe that you're insane yourself. Believe anything you like. Only don't look. You two have made a coward of me, but you said that it is dead. For some minutes we stood there by the tent in that weird gloom, then turned to leave the cursed spot. I said that undoubtedly Amundsen had left some records inside, and that we ought to secure any such memories. Sutherland and Travers nodded, but each declared that we must get away from the awful place, get back to the world of men with our fearful message. You won't tell me what you saw, I said, and yet you want to get back so that you can tell it to the world? We aren't going to tell the world what we saw. We couldn't, answered Sutherland. And if we could, not a living soul would believe us. But we can warn people, for that thing in there did not come alone. Where is the other one, or the others? Amen, said Sutherland. But maybe, as Bill said, it isn't dead. Sutherland paused, and a wild, indescribable look came into his eyes. Maybe it can't die. What was the use? What good would it do to try to reason with them? Yes, we must get away from this spot, or they would have me insane too. And the long road back? Could we ever make it now? And what had they seen? What unimaginable horror was there behind that thin wall of canvas? Well, whatever it was, it was real. Of that I could not entertain the slightest doubt. Real? real enough to wreck the strong brains of two strong men? But were my poor companions really mad after all? Or maybe, Sutherland was saying, the other one or the others went back to wherever they came from to get more of their kind. If that is so, heaven have pity on us all. And if it or they are still here on this earth, then sooner or later, it may be a dozen years, it may be a century, Sooner or later the world will know it, for they will come again. I was thinking, began Travers, his eyes fixed on the tent, that it might be good to empty the rifle into that thing. It may help things some, said Travers, starting toward his sled. A moment or two and he had got out the rifle. It isn't earthly, Bill, Sutherland said hoarsely. It's a nightmare. I think we'd better go now. Travers was going straight toward the tent. Come back, Bill, groaned Sutherland. Come back. Let us leave while we can. But Travers did not come back. Slowly he moved forward, rifle thrust out before him, finger on the trigger. He reached the tent, hesitated a moment, then thrust the rifle barrel through. As fast as he could work trigger and lever, he emptied the weapon into the tent, into that horror inside it. What was that? The blood seemed to freeze in my veins and heart as there arose from out of the tent a sound, a sound low and throbbing, one that I hope no man will ever hear again. And then a panic seized upon us, men and dogs alike, and away we fled from that cursed place. The sound ceased, but again we heard it. It was more fearful, more unearthly, 
soul maddening, hellish than before. Look, cried Sutherland. Oh my God, look at that. The tent was barely visible behind us now. A moment or two, and the curtain of gloom would conceal it. At first I could not imagine what had made Sutherland cry out like that. Then I saw it, in that very moment before the gloom hid it from view. The tent was moving. It swayed, jerked like some shapeless monster in the throes of death. And that is what we saw. I have set it down to the best of my ability under the truly awful circumstances in which I am placed. Whether this record is destined ever to reach the world, ever to be scanned by the eye of another, only the future can answer that. I will try to hope for the best, but it is not only this sinister, nameless mystery from which we are fleeing, but it is the minds of my companions and the fear for my own mind. But I must get myself in hand. After all, as Sutherland said, I didn't see it. I must not give way. We must somehow get our story to the world, though we may have for our reward only the mockery of the world's unbelief. We're a dozen miles or so from the pole now. In that mad dash away from that tent of horror, we lost our bearings, and for a time I fear went panicky. Just when we were about to give up in despair, we chanced upon one of our beacons. This gave us our bearings, and we pressed on to this spot. Travers is sure he saw something moving off in the gloom. Something moving. January 5. We, the three of us, saw it again today. Was it that thing they saw in Amundsen's tent? We don't know what it is. All we know is it moves. God have pity on us all. Sixth. Made 25 miles today. 20 yesterday. Did not see it today, but heard it. It seemed near. Effect on the dogs, most terrible. Poor brutes, it is as horrible to them as it is to us. Sometimes I think even more. Why is it following us? Seventh. Two of the dogs gone this morning. One or another of us on guard all night. Nothing seen, not a sound heard. Yet the animals have vanished. Did they desert us? We say that is what happened, but none of us believes it. Made 18 miles. Travis is gone. He took the watch last night at 12 for leaving Sutherland. That was the last scene of Travers, the last that we shall ever see. No tracks, not a sign in the snow. Who will be the next? January 9. Saw it again. Why does it let us see it like this? Sometimes. Is it that horror in Amundsen's tent? Sutherland declares that it is not, that it is something even more hellish. But then Sutherland is mad now. If I wasn't sane, I could think that it was all only imagination. But I saw it. January 11. I think it is the 11th, but I'm not sure. I, I'm no longer sure of anything, save that I am alone and that it is watching me. I don't know how I know, for I cannot see it, but I do know it is watching me. It is always watching, and sometime it will come and get me. Yes, today must be the 11th, for it was yesterday. Surely it was only yesterday that it took Sutherland. I didn't see it take him. A fog had come up, and Sutherland was so slow in following that the vapor hid him from view. 
At last, when he didn't come, I went back. He was gone. Man, dogs, sled, everything gone. Poor Sutherland. But then he was mad. Probably that was why it took him. Has it spared me because I am yet sane? Sutherland, always he clung to that rifle as though a bullet could save him from what we saw. My only weapon is an axe. But what good is that? January 13th. Maybe it's the 14th, I don't know. What does it matter? Saw it three times today. Each time closer. Dogs still whining about tent. There. That horrible hellish sound again. The dogs are still now. That sound again. But I dare not look out. The axe. Hours later, can't write anymore. Silence. Voices. I seem to hear voices. But that sound again, coming nearer. At entrance now. No.